many stories exist about a boy and his dog. But this one's a bit different. Mostly because it's not about a boy, it's about a town, and the dog is less like a dog and more like a horse. Yes, this story is about a town and their horse. I'm not horsing around. I'm just making some not so funny puns. I'm Cody Creech, and welcome to Quiet Town, an audible road trip to lost history and local lore. This is a shortcut episode, which runs between our bi-weekly full episodes. Shortcuts cover shorter stories, as the name would suggest, but are still just as insightful. So buckle your seatbelt, because this week we are traveling to a small town with a romantic determination to be something. The term commitment to education is thrown around today often as a form of political jargon, but the term has never been more literally interpreted than when a small town in Utah committed in the late 1800s. Utah had interest in establishing a new normal school, and popular cities like Beaver and Dixie were likely landing spots for the new investment. Beaver with an old fort that would be available for remodeling into a schoolhouse, and Dixie with a moderate climate that kept the town from harsh winters. But the Academy's title selection was instead narrowed down to two towns. Cedar City, a far from prosperous manufacturing town in Utah's southwestern corner, and Parowan, another small town just northeast of its competitor. Cedar City knew they were embarking on a difficult path, but it was one they saw a future in. The project was estimated to cost upward of $35,000 and the means of attaining these type of funds were not certain. So a plan was constructed between Cedar City and Parowan. The town that lost the state's normal school selection would have to pay the winning town $2,400 in cash, materials, and labor. But just before the agreement was signed, word leaked out that Cedar City had been selected, and the non-endorsed deal fell flat. Cedar City was now on their own. The small town was just 1,500 Dutch, Welsh, and Scottish descendants, but the only candidate without a pool hall or saloon, which probably made it a more attractive candidate for the quite modest Utah way of life. The town would sign over a deed of 15 acres to the state in which the school would be built upon. And when the architect's building plans made it back to Cedar City, the town concluded that the project was beyond any capability of the community. A grand building asking to be built on limited resources and time. So instead, the community allocated a downtown building to serve as the university, and classes began in 1897. But it would only take two short months before their solution would become a major issue. As Utah's Attorney General caught wind of Cedar City's circumvention of the plans, he began to reject the university's payroll submissions. Teachers now found themselves essentially working for free, not necessarily the best way to make an early impression on new educators. The Attorney General was A.C. Bishop, Utah's first, and he determined that the current building being used for education did not meet the requirements of the state. The building must be built on land deeded to the state specifically for the school, and not just a vacant building deemed proper for learning. And the conditions of building the proper facility were now altered as well. If Cedar City wasn't able to complete their new headquarters, by September of the following year, the school was to be removed from the state-funded slate. But the community was determined to cut through the red tape and make the impossible possible. They were committed to education. First, they attacked the issue of payroll. Three separate families of Cedar City took out mortgage loans on their homes from a local bank and used the funds to fulfill the teacher's missing wages. 
The second issue was exactly how to get their building constructed. The cost alone equaled the town's yearly business income, and the winter season meant having to battle through massive snowdrifts and sub-zero temperatures. So they started with a building committee who dedicated all public and private resources to the construction process. And the committee had to reach deep into their pockets to manage the cost. But in the end, they came up with the hefty sum. In the midst of winter, January 5th, 1898, a group of five men began a trek to a sawmill about 35 miles east-northeast of Cedar City, near what is today the tiny town of Bryan Head and the ski resort that is now located there as well. As if the long journey to obtain and return lumber for the building wasn't enough, the expedition had to endure a record-setting snowstorm. The return back to Cedar City was a toilsome trip as the fleet pushed through 15-foot snowdrifts, often 100 feet long. Temperatures plunged to 40 below, and the crew turned gunny sacks into layered clothing. And when the provisions could not make it to them, they lived off of dried peaches. And here arrives our hero. Not a knight in shining armor mounted on his steed. Instead, it's the steed himself, an old sorrel horse spearheading the caravan and thrusting through the drifts, one after another, the snow fighting back against his powerful legs. The horse was determined and relentless, and when he did need a break, he would sit for a moment, plopping down on his hind legs and catching his breath, but only moments later he was up again, ready to front the convoy, plowing the snow from the trail and step by step guiding the pieces of the university. Many men made the trip from Cedar to the sawmill between that January and July. All of their tasks divided up to progress the construction as quickly as possible. Certain people cut the logs and others planed them into lumber planks. And about every two and a half days, a new batch of wood would be hauled down the mountain and formed into a portion of the structure. The building plans called for more than a quarter of a million bricks, and to keep up with the schedule, workers often clocked 14-hour days. But the facility called for more than just masonry and lumber. Cold hard cash was generously donated to the project by families who sold their stocks in cattle companies and co-op stores. And many families who couldn't offer stock contributed in other ways. One family gave wood straight from the side of their barn Another gave supplies that were planned for a kitchen addition. And many families donated prize wood that was being saved for coffins. All the sacrifices and extended hours would pay off when in September 1898, the building was completed. Fit with a large chapel, a library and a reading room, a natural history museum, biological and physical laboratories, classrooms and offices. Cedar City had proved that they were truly committed to education. Today, this building is known as Old Main. It sits as part of the campus of Southern Utah University. And it's not so different than its 1898 self. The interior has been remodeled multiple times but the exterior walls have been constant. The work of over a hundred dedicated men and women still being used to educate nearly a century and a half later. Cedar City has grown since then, of course, but it's still a small college town. The All-American Diner off Main Street is a staple for the late rising college kid, and the grind is a down-to-earth coffee shop where you can grab yourself a quick pick-me-up before you make the trip to hike Zion National Park. Every year, Cedar hosts the Utah Shakespeare Festival, a partnership with the university, 
pulling plays from Shakespeare's pen and mixing in contemporary pieces as well. Every year, the festival draws in nearly 120,000 guests. And two years ago, I was one of them. I saw Mary Poppins, and as I am not, nor do I claim to be a theater expert, I very much enjoyed the performance. And I would highly recommend you make the time for a show or two as well. If you time it well, you can catch the 4th of July parades or the yearly herding of the sheep across the main strip of town. Cedar City has character. But what about our hero, the old sorrel horse that the community had deemed that savior of the project? Well, in 1986, he got his recognition. Not too far away from the old main building, a large statue was placed. An old sorrel horse battling through neck-high heaps of icy terrain as two founders look upon him to pull them through the bind. It's known as the Founders Monument, and it's dedicated to the men and women who made the little manufacturing town into a community rooted in education. And of course, dedicated to old Sorrel, who made it all possible. In 1998, the Boy Scouts of Cedar Break placed a plaque depicting the trail that old Sorrel conquered a hundred years before. You can still attempt to follow the path yourself, but beware that it is not for the faint of heart even when it doesn't mean trekking through mountains of snow. This episode of Quiet Town is written and produced by me, Cody Creech. But the stories don't have to stop here. By subscribing to Quiet Town on Patreon, you'll be able to access exclusive content, including next week's episode, available right now. Find me on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at Quiet Town Podcast, Twitter at Quiet Town Pod, and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Right now, all five star written reviews are entered to win a $50 gas card. Find us at our website at QuietTownPodcast.com. Message me. I want to hear from you. Tell me your favorite Quiet Town stories, and one day, it may just become an episode itself. I love listening and learning just like you. So, tell me a story. And of course, thank you for listening. I'll be back next Monday with a brand new episode. Until then, I'll just leave you with this clip from the next one. I want to tell the world that there was once a race of people that lived here that were remarkable. I didn't intend to make it this large, you know. I intended to make something a hundred feet high. And a hundred foot figure would look like nothing. And I said, oh, what the hell, I got no place to go. So I slept over there for five mornings, five nights. And I said, I'll carve the whole mountain. Now, now they knew I was crazy. <laughs>